Thank you for inviting me to this fantastic tribunal uh, against all forms of sexual exploitation. It is an honor to be here. Today I'm going to talk about what I think is good practices uh, in order to prevent and combat prostitution around the world, most of which I've been involved directly. Uh, but before I do that, I just want to talk about being a feminist for a moment. I think, and I can see that if we go all the way back in history, feminists have been central, essential, contre la lutte contre la prostitution. I think we've done amazing work, and I think that we need to keep that up when we continue our work to prevent and combat prostitution in Canada and elsewhere. In order to find successful solution to the problem of prostitution, it is necessary to think about and discuss among ourselves what kind of society we wish to live in. We have to find our ideological base and then develop a political vision that ensures a just society for all. With our vision in mind, we can then develop and implement different measures and initiatives that over time will fulfill our vision while keeping in mind the internationally recognized values of human rights, equality, dignity, integrity, and I, as a radical feminist, would like to add solidarity. I hear wherever I go, I've been to 45 countries, I counted them this morning when I couldn't sleep, uh, working, where women's organizations are working to change the lives of women in prostitution and to change the attitude towards prostitution and the prostitution industry. And everywhere I hear, just as what Rosella said, le Canada n'est pas la Suède, or the UK is not Sweden, or South Africa is not Sweden, or South Korea is not Sweden. I will explain to you just as in the early women's movement in the conferences, everybody stood up and said, I'm also a lesbian, to show that it's possible to come out. I can say that every country is Sweden when it comes to changing the policies on prostitution and trafficking. But to do that, we, ha we can't fall into the traps of neoliberalism. We, ca we should not do, as some countries and some promoters suggest, succumb to resignation and base our actions on the idea that prostitution is inevitable, inescapable and necessary, something that always will exist and therefore should be accepted because men need it, women choose it, or because prostitution has always existed as the oldest profession in the world. Because if we follow that model of ideas, we will implement measures after the fact, when women and girls already have fallen victims to this very serious form of violence. Measures that we claim reduces the harm of prostitution, such as tolerance zones, safe sex programs, safer street measures, or we may even license women as sex workers, force them to undergo regular health checks, and repeal all legislation to allow procuring legal and licensed brothels and give full legitimacy to the prostitution industry as a viable economic sector. We've already tried that. From 1840 to 1910, or to 1920 in Europe, we had a system of regulation where all of these things were in place. Women fought to, to bring that down, and we won that battle. And we're not going to have to do that again, I think. But if we want to go ahead and do it the right way, we have to reject the idea that a subclass of already oppressed and marginalized women and girls should be used as commodities that can be bought and sold. We must firmly uncover and reject the universal misconception that men have an inherent right to pay for and sexually exploit women and girls. We must conclude that it's possible to eliminate sexual exploitation and aim to create a society based on feminist principles a society in which prostitution is seen as violence against women, incompatible with the dignity and worth of the human person and the equal rights of men and women. So, the Canada n'est pas la Suède. What I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna look at different measures that has been done for the past 20 years 
that I think have been useful, and I'm going to give you examples where they're done. What we want to do, as we did when we were working on other forms of violence, was to say, we wanted to draw a line in the sand to say to those men who use their privilege in different ways to exert violence on women and girls, battering, sexual abuse, sexual harassment, female genital mutilation, and one of the oldest harmful traditional practices, prostitution. We wanted to say, don't punish the victims, punish those who are doing the harm. And in the case of prostitution, it is those who have the direct con contact with those in prostitution, the buyers, the men who sexually exploit women and girls and young men in prostitution. All the others are usually criminalized as we have it now. Legislation was the first that came into the mind of us in the Swedish women's movement, and we succeeded as Rosella so very well described the situation from her voyage. But Sweden is not the only country. Rosella pointed to Norway and Iceland. Uh, Norway and Iceland waited 10 years because they really wanted to make sure that we hadn't made a mistake. Uh, and also I think there's a there's the continuous, uh, Sweden colonized all of these countries once upon a time, and that actually plays into, I'm not joking, it plays into some of the decision. But there are other countries that followed, and actually the first country that followed Sweden may surprise you, because that was South Korea. South Korea changed their laws in 2005, and they replicated, I think it was 2005, they replicated the Swedish law that prohibits the purchase of a sexual service, and they put into place uh, ser um, services for victims in prostitution, and they decided that they were gonna shut down the prostitution industry in Korea, which I'm sure you know is one of the most horrific places to go because you have U.S. naval bases on one end and then you have Japanese males traveling from to Korea and there's a racist aspect to that one. And of course the local men who buy uh, women in prostitution. It's one of the worst industries I've been to. Uh, the women's South Korean women's movement were right in the middle of pushing for these changes. They were very brave. They were threatened by the prostitution industry. They had their offices invaded by pimps. They did all kinds of things. And the law passed. And then there was a change in government. And that change in government has not done anything to, uh, to, to use the legislation, but it's still there. Another country that will surprise you that was also before Norway and Iceland was South, South Africa. South Africa changes <laughs> changed its sexual assault legislation and it included almost word by word a legislation that replicates the Swedish law that criminalizes the purchase of a sexual service. Uh, in South Africa, the law is on the books. It has not been used uh, very widely, but it's there and for South African women's groups, it is a hope that maybe the situation can change. But I will show you that you need to do more than just the law for the law to work. Finland had the law on the books, but failed, because in the last few months of the Law Commission's consultation on the legislation, suddenly a number of sex worker organizations popped out of the woodwork from nowhere and presented women. For example, I was presenting at the Law Commission, and just after me was 15 young women from Estonia uh, who were in prostitution in, in Helsinki and who were said to have chosen to come voluntarily uh, to be in prostitution in, in Finland, which we know is not true. So their law is not very useful and should not be replicated. I was involved in an interesting legal project in the UK. The UK has sim had similar legislation to Canada. So uh, uh, UK can, Canada can. <laughs> the UK had the solicitation laws and of course living off the avail and brothel legislation. They decided, or we decided, because we started a campaign called the Demand Change Campaign. It's online, it's called the Demand Change Coalition. You can read all of the lobbying material, everything we did, use it, replicate it. We managed to change the legislation partly in the UK. It, was, it came into force on 1st of April last year. And it is a differentiated crime, as we say. It, criminalizes the purchase of a sexual service in certain instances where the woman is controlled by somebody. So if there is a pimp, if you can prove there is a pimp. What was interesting in the UK is that the, the London Metropolitan Police and other police forces were very interested in, in emphasizing 
this legislation, so they did lots of arrests immediately. Moving right along, because I have very little time, I know. Moving on to Germany and Netherlands, two countries who you wouldn't think would be interested in doing legislation to uh, minimize the men who purchase, minimize the effect of the men purchasing women in the industry. They have realized, of course, that if you decriminalize the prostitution industry, you open the doors to those who sell the com commodities, meaning traffickers organize crime. Uh, the Dutch police concluded in 2008 that between 50 and 90 percent of those who were in the legal sector were quote unquote employed involuntarily, meaning they were victims of trafficking. So in their latest proposals, there is also a modified legislation to criminalize the purchase of sexual services. The Dutch one is a bit funny because it says uh, those who purchase a woman who has no license can be uh, criminalized. So when you have a system of decriminalization, everything gets absurd. It is the reversal of reality. Germany has also proposed, and the interesting thing where they proposed their legislation is that they put it into their national action plan on violence against women. And that's exactly where it should be. Also modified, similar to the Dutch one, but still there, still uh, a promise to do it. So that's done. We have two countries where we're waiting for bills to go through. Scotland, Scotland is its own jurisdiction, even if it's part of the UK. Uh, I've been very involved there. I love the women who do their work in Scotland. They've been going for years. Glasgow City has a, has a special anti-prostitution policy. Anyone who works for the city council has to sign on to this policy, meaning that prostitution is violence, that you're not allowed to purchase somebody and so forth. But even more interesting, they have a legislative proposal that was put to the parliament on the 17th of March last week, or what is it, three days ago. It is a comprehensive legislation that criminalizes the purchase of a sexual service. It's going to be discussed on Tuesday, was going to be discussed this Tuesday, but it, election was called, so there's an election on Tuesday. But it's, we're quite confident that the Labour Party will carry it on across the, the election, no matter if they get out or in a power. Another place uh, is Ireland. Ireland has a law proposal. And Ireland is interesting in, in other aspects because they have also legislation that targeted prostitution-related crimes. And specifically, they passed legislation two years ago uh, banning all advertisements for any prostitution activity. So brothel, internet sites, whatever, you can do that. Uh, and they're applying it. In Sweden, we, have, we use the procuring legislation that could be done in Canada. You can use the anti-trafficking legislation if you want to be clever. Uh, there are ways to get around it without having to change the legislation. You just need active and engaged prosecutors who are willing to take the case. There's a case now in the UK run by the London Metropolitan Police that's going to court in one or two weeks where, they have, uh, where the police has charged the newspaper owners and also those, I don't know if you've been in the UK, but there's usually business cards in telephone boxes where the, with services, prostitution services. And they've taken the owners of these companies to court and saying that they're facilitating prostitution and they are, if they get convicted, they're gonna get horrendous fines, which is lovely. Finland, a, a women's group did that. It didn't even need the legislation. A women's Swedish-Finnish uh, women's group decided to uh, go against the two largest papers, Helsing and Sanomat, and Husas Bladet, and said to uh, the owners that if you don't remove these advertisements that were worth 8.5 million euros per year, uh, we're going to make sure that everybody stops subscribing to your paper. And so immediately, almost, after some negotiations, the newspaper decided to remove the advertisements, and they're not there anymore. Um, another legislation that I think would be very applicable to go after in here is the licensing systems, the municipal licensing systems, where the, the city of Montreal or the city of Vancouver can give licenses to uh, agencies, activities that are in fact prostitution activities but are called massage activities or hands-on activities or whatever words they decide to do. Uh, put on it. Uh, in Scotland also, they have uh, gone after the local licensing. They've changed the scheme. 
in the UK, the rest of the UK, when we did the legislative change on the buying, we also got through a licensing limit. So the police can now decide. It's the police who decide who is getting the licenses, not the city council. And I think that would be very helpful in Canada to do that. Now, enough of legislation, because of course we also, we target the root cause of prostitution, demand. Because if you remove the demand, those who sell the commodities, I repeat, have no market. And if there is no market, they will not come to where you are. They will go where the market is. And the market is where the activities are decriminalized. Victim services are necessary to ensure that women, in, women and young men in prostitution have the possibilities, access, and it's free to leave prostitution. And it's to be services that are not harm reduction, but of have the vision that it's possible for women and it's wished for women in prostitution to be able to have a life outside and not be subjected to these forms of serious violations. Just mention a few victim service programs that I think are wonderful. There's one in Denmark called Reven, The Nest. It's been going since 1983. They're very good. There's another one in the UK called Eves for Women. They are the national central for traffic victims also. And then there is a victims of trafficking widely interpreted as almost everyone in Norway called Project Rosa. Another thing that's necessary to do uh, when you work on prostitution and trafficking, and you do work on that together, you don't separate it, is to look at the general social, economic, political, and legal conditions for women and girls. Because if, as, Canada ha as has happened in Canada, where uh, poverty rates have gone up because there's been a, a lack of redistribution of wealth in this country, leaving many women and girls inc incredibly vulnerable to the attacks of those men and pimps and traffickers who want to benefit uh, of, on, on their vulnerability. We did something in Sweden that I think nobody else have done except for the US during George Bush, I have to say, and that is to ensure that those countries where most of the victims of trafficking come to Sweden, that we work with those governments and fund shelters. Because what we find is when we return women who are trafficked across borders, is that we can, they can stay in Sweden if they decide to go back, there is not, no services. Conclusion, give me two minutes, okay? Uh, what is important also is to do normative measures so awareness raising campaigns like this one, which was all over Sweden, that's uh, focusing on the men, visibilizing the men as buyers, is something that I think is incredibly important. And again, Canada, n'est pas la Suède. In Lebanon, where I work, women's groups have also taken an abolitionist approach to prostitution. This is a country in armed conflict. This is a country where there are internal strife this is a country that is extremely poor. This is a country where women don't have even the basic rights that we can say that we have. But they have taken on a project. They want to change the legislation and have a law uh, that criminalizes the purchase of a sexual service. And they're doing something that we all should be doing, and that is feminist uh, participatory research on the prostitution industry locally to show what exactly it means to women's rights in Lebanon. Uh, look at what they do. Canada is not, Canada is comme la Suède. <laughs> I'm working also with a group in the West Bank, in the Palestine territories. There's lots of prostitution in Ramallah and on the West Bank, uh, not talked about. Uh, those women are even more in dire straits right now. They're willing to stick their heads out and say, we want to criminalize the buyers and help the women out. So uh, research, 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 research. And don't care about when academics come to say to you that it's not scientific enough. Don't listen to them. Do your research. Show what's going on in your city. <laughs> I, I you have to get friendly with the police. Oh, I know, you don't want to hear that. Oh. I'm very friendly with the police. Most of my best, my best colleagues are the police because you need the police, you need to train the police, you need to train the prosecutors, otherwise we won't get the pimps, we won't get the traffickers, and we won't get 
the buyers who buy these women, but make sure that you train them, not just on how to in investigate, but actually the principles, the visions, the principles that we set out when I was in the government in Sweden. Our, all our police know it, right? Yeah. And they act from it. I want to tell you uh, just a good news. Work on the larger uh, international bodies. Last week, March 15, the European Parliament took a resolution on violence against women. Uh, we had worked long and hard with that. We were an advisory group of women's groups and experts like myself around the Europe. That resolution included the fact that prostitution is a form of violence against women in the European Union. Can you believe it? It's an incredible victory. Do resolutions, do it on a grassroots level, do it everywhere, do it in your union, do it at, employment, at your place of employment, wherever you move. And lobby, lobby, lobby. Find, find that person in the parliament, in your legislature, in the local government, in your local whatever, lobby them. That's how we succeeded. Do lobby, 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 lobby and be smart about it, and don't give them any peace. Never back off, never give up. Thank you.